What's up, Catherine? Let me know if you can hear me or can't hear me. Because I cannot hear you. Uh, there are some things at the bottom of the screen. All right, welcome back to Informational Interviews with Passion Impact. My name is Stefan Pearls. I go by he, him. Uh, and we are here today with the lovely, wait, let me share my screen first so that I, we're all on the same page visually. I'm a visual learner with Catherine Wynn and Nikki Passarella. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Super excited to have y'all. Um, we're going to go over a few things before we get started here. So overview, I'm just going to take about five minutes to, to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to talk in an interview with y'all for about 25 minutes and then open up for questions with students. Um, and then at 4.55, we'll wrap up with a reflection and, and around five o'clock. Does that sound good? Awesome. All right, first and foremost, just want to touch base. These are the businesses who have sponsored and supported Passion Impact over the past five to six years. Um, I tried to read them really fast last time. I'm not going to do that because I will butcher it again. So Take a good hard look at some of these. They're really great. A lot of them are local and a lot of them really need your help right now. So if you can, maybe spend one day a week um, buying out to support these local businesses. These are some great groups that would really, really appreciate your help. Um, there's a few on here uh, that some of our students' families run. So I'll point out New Thai Blues and Tecos Mexican Food. So um, those specifically are really, really cool. Definitely would like to help them out. That being said, uh, I wanna go over some meeting expectations. We do show gratitude and respect for all those in the video chat. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, where you're calling in from, we will show respect to you. Um, everyone here is muted by the facilitator and that is Adriana the bouncer. Um, so when you raise your hand, uh, that's when you can be called on. And that'll be more towards the end when we have our, our student questions. So just to make sure that everyone knows how to raise your hand in Zoom, please find that button now. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, okay, we got one. Kayla, you're first on this one. You're good. You got it, Kayla. Way to go. If you're having issues, let's see. Christina, can you find it yet? <laughs> Catherine, can you find it? I bet you could figure it out. Me? Yeah, okay. sure. I'm Raise your really hand. I'm really bad at this. That's okay. <laughs> Melissa, are you still looking for it? <laughs> options it's okay so um let's see i want to make sure that you do know where it is reactions oh thumbs up kind of getting closer it's it should be under manage participants or participants uh, uh -oh. there's like a little there's three little lines i think next time i'm gonna actually just put it on the screen so that y'all can see it um okay we see right. it cool. cool awesome 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 um, Melissa, if we get to you and you don't know how to, hey, there he is. Sweet. Cool. Awesome. So go ahead and lower your hand. Thank you for that. You guys are all, when you have a question, that's what we'll do. Um, and Adriana, the bouncer, will call on you at that point in time. Um, when you do get called on, please introduce yourself, your, your name, your pronouns, if you're comfortable doing that. Um, but make sure you're writing down your questions now so when we get to them, you have them ready. This goes without saying, no nudity, vulgar or demeaning language or inappropriate sharing of your screen will be tolerated. We reserve the right to remove any individual, um, even you, Catherine Nikki, just in case. Um, so none of that, please. Uh, but most importantly, have fun, stay engaged, all right? With that, let's get the show on the road. So we have two fantastic women joining us today. I'm super excited that y'all are here with us. We have Catherine Wynn. Let's just go through this a little bit. She lived in Virginia for 23 years received her bachelor's in psychology and nutrition with minors in religious studies and sociology from Virginia Tech, bounced around a little bit, Colorado, Washington, landed in Portland about 2018, and then founded and operates more and more farms in Gresham, Oregon. Both farming, farming is like really a compliment to, to her, her personality and really challenges her. Um, she enjoys being outdoors, hanging out with her cat, sitting on the porch, reading books and enjoying good conversation. And of, of course, she's passionate about tomatoes. So that's Catherine. Thank you, Catherine, for joining us. Uh, and Nikki, thank you so much for joining us as well. In 2017, intern at Zenger Farm. If anybody has not heard of Zenger Farm, looking forward to you getting this. It's down just past 205 um, Foster, just going east on, two of, uh, on Foster. 
served as the market manager for the Portland Farmers Market, proudly served on the board of the Woodstock Farmers Market, which you do sell at currently or going to be doing this summer, um, participates in Cook First Portland, has contributed to the Huckleberry Magazine, and is a co-owner and operator of the Amica Farm Stewarding, uh, which is operating on one acre of farm in Gresham, Oregon, with Arena Shabram. I hope I didn't pronounce that wrong. Um, and then she is passionate about building community around local food. Without further ado, I'm going to shut up and pass the torch over to y'all. Please introduce yourselves and then we can get into some questions in a bit. Okay, um, I'm Catherine. Um, I feel like Safan did a great job introducing me. <laughs> That's me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, would you guys care to, would y'all care to tell us your pronouns if that's okay with you? Oh, yes. She, her. She, her also. Um, you know, we could start about the, um, we're, Catherine and I know each other because our farm businesses participate in a farm incubator program in Gresham. Did we mention that before or should we talk about that? Oh, let's, let's hear about that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Irina, my business partner and I established our business in January of 2018 around the same time Catherine did too. And we met here. Um, so, uh, it's called Headwaters Farm and Headwaters Farm is about 40 acres just in East Gresham, almost like uh, boring or Orient, but nobody knows those names around here. Uh, so, the land is owned by the East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, and their mission and intention is to preserve natural green spaces, um, particularly when we've got like suburban sprawl happening. Um, so one small part of what the district does is offer this land that has uh, to emerging farm businesses who otherwise don't have the funds or capacity to get a traditional lease to grow food. So what that means is our businesses like applied to be part of this program and we got accepted, which is cool, uh, to lease land from the district for up to five years at a very reduced rate from what the, like the normal market rate would be for water, for land that includes water, um, shared barn space, tractor usage that we can rent, um, storage space, like including cooler space, dry storage for potatoes and onions, um, Oh, tools, like all kinds of things, plus um, meeting really cool other business owners and learning together and sharing in our successes and challenges. Um, so I think it's important to mention like how we met and also that we're part of this like pretty unique program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I think that like everyone who's gone through the program, it's relatively new. I think we just had our third, third graduating class. I think so. Yeah. And it's five years. So it's like eight years old. Um, it seems like everyone has said that one of the most um, significant parts of being in the Headwaters program is allowing, it's like putting yourself into the farming community in Portland, because um, so many of the farmers here grow for CSAs, markets, restaurants, and I don't know, it's, it's just like shared knowledge, which is fantastic. Totally. Yeah, that's, I mean, what, what y'all are doing out there is remarkable and it's really cool to see that not only you committed to it but you're in the midst of it it's not just like you know oh we started we still don't know what you're doing. it's like you know what you're doing you're really going after it <laughs> oh from our perspective it absolutely seems so. all right but i want to take a few steps back all right so we didn't all get here overnight um there were a lot of things that happened in your lives you were born you became toddlers you then matriculated into high school so let's start in high school what the heck did you want to do Thinking back to senior year of high school, you're about to walk across the stage. What were you going to do with your life? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I honestly thought I would, uh, I, I'm the youngest of two, two, uh, three. How did, youngest of three, <laughs> I have two older siblings. I was like, how do people <laughs> phrase that? <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I honestly thought I was going to, like follow their path. Um, both of them went to school for um, engineering and I, Virginia Tech, if you know, it is like a, one of like the specialties is engineering. Um, so I kind of just like ended up there. When I was in high school, I had no idea what I, what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Nikki, did you have an idea as to what you wanted to do? 
Right. I think like when I was a little, little kid, I had dreams of things, but, um, in high school, I was probably that student that like, um, didn't, wasn't studious would be a nice way of saying it. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was voted, uh, the class clown of my senior, like whatever those things are called. Um, I was a total like not school kind of person. Um, but I had part-time jobs since I was 15, like always worked hard and always had a, a work ethic. So I just continued to work full time out of high school and have no formal education after high school. Um, other than like the apprenticeship I did a few years ago for farming. Um, so I think for me, it was more just about like, I don't know what I want to do. And I know I don't like like school in a box like that of what school was to me um, 20 years ago when I finished high school. Because I'm a little Can older. Can you say that again? <laughs> what you um, yeah, I finished high school in 2001. Uh, so at that time, like just for me, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know. And I knew I didn't want to waste my time or energy or money. Uh, so I just worked full time out of high school uh, in and around like the restaurant world. And for a while I thought I would pursue some kind of like career in food service or like personal chef or catering or nutrition or something around the food preparation, which is then how, yeah, ended up doing this instead. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, something that stood out to me when you said there was a school in a box um, and that is very much what it seems like school, school can seem like for students these days still. Um, I, I'm curious if there were other things that you felt attracted you to more experiential learning outside of that school, maybe even in high school um, or even outside. Obviously, you said you didn't um, go to a, a, like a specific college or anything like that. But what was like uh, the experiential learning that you were looking for? Um, and I'll throw that to Catherine as well, too. Yeah, you know, it's funny, like now that you I have hindsight on where I was at like 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, I can answer that from like the Nikki now, but really at that time, I think, um, I, I think I just had enough, um, self-awareness to know that I really had no idea what I was doing, um, mm -hmm. and didn't really have any direction and knew that I wanted to earn money so that I could like, yeah, put gas in my car and be independent, um, in that way. But I think as I grew into like a managerial role, uh, in this small like company that I worked for, I'm from Pennsylvania, from the Philadelphia area. Sure. Um, yeah, as I ended up like hiring people to work for me in this job I'd had since I was like 15, started minimum wage and was like, Oh, I have like a career. I could have a career in this. Um, I think what I was really looking for was um, proving it to myself that I could do it and do fill in the blank is it. I think that, um, for me learning in school was like, why am I proving? Like, I don't, I don't care about this material. Honestly, there's nothing I was that focused on. And it didn't, I didn't prove to myself in here that I was like capable of doing the, the task. Um, so I think I've always been inclined to go towards jobs that you see the difference. You see what you do materialize is why farming is so great because the landscape shifts physically mm -hmm. um yeah it was about like proving it to myself that i could do a thing like a tangible thing i think cool yeah, yeah. very cool Catherine. like yeah where, where was your experiential learning kind of was that is that part of your your want when you're in education um no <laughs> <laughs> honestly i i think that like when when i was going through high school and even college much of my expect expectation landed um, like where my parents' expectations were, and it had more of a uh, cultural story to it than um, I would say post college. But it was it was like expected as I went through high school and even college that like I would focus pretty heavily on schoolwork um, to the point where it's like I wanted to get a job, and my parents were like, "No, no, no, we'll pay for everything." you just keep mm -hmm. on uh, studying. Um, so I did my first resume at like an embarrassingly, embarrassingly late age. I wanna huh. say I was like a, a senior <laughs> in college. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Um, so 
and then I maybe did like three years of resumes and then I'm like here <laughs> I don't I don't do one anymore <laughs> can we can we dig into something here um you, your parents said no 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 you focus on your education we'll pay for everything how did that make you feel at that time yeah Honestly, it, it didn't feel, I think only in hindsight was I like, oh, I'd rather that not have been the case. But I think it was like the script that both my brother and my sister played out. So it seemed normal. And all my, all my um, like cousins and extended family. So it, like, seemed, it seemed normal and it seemed, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, and Nikki, how did your parents feel about you starting work at 15 and then like, I'm gonna do my thing? Right, I think my, I'm also the youngest of three. Huh. Cool. Well. Um, there's a pretty significant age difference in my siblings though. My sister is 13 years older than I am. Um, my parents just, I don't know, like had a, kids <laughs> over three decades. Um, oh so, yeah, both my parents, um, also didn't have formal education after high school. Um, my dad owned a business, like he drove a cab, like he was a cab, owned a cab stand. Um, so I think my parents were like, yeah, you're getting a job at 15. Like, uh, where are you gonna be getting your job at 15? Like, um, and not because we, uh, like I grew up in quite comfortably, comfortably actually, like I didn't, yeah we had piles of presents for birthdays and like very, very comfortable growing up, but it was very encouraged to have a job um, at the age that you could. Like, I think you, I don't know if you still have to do this. We had to go to like get working papers at 14. You had to like get your doctor to say that you were like, because of like child labor laws and stuff from like a long time ago, um, like an actually like a hundred years ago. Um, yeah. I had to like get papers signed by my doctor and my like school teacher that I was like, okay to work. Cause I was like, four, I think 14. Um, so yeah, that was just normal. Like you're nor it was normal for me to be working and it felt great. It was independent. It was yeah. awesome. And my parents, yeah, definitely, um, were, so they were a lot older than a lot of my peers, parents. Um, my parents, my dad was like 60 when I finished high school, uh, roughly, I think. So it just like, is a different thing when you grow up with parents that are like, it's cool. We're old, whatever. Like there wasn't a ton of engagement. Um, very supportive of what I wanted to do, but not a ton of like, we're going to tell you what to do. Um, so I just kept working and that was cool. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, but like I think... said, what's normal. Like we all have that experience of like, what's normal in your family. Mm -hmm. Um, we all think that's normal till we leave home and then we're like, Oh, other people do other things, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I've, you know, I've definitely talked to students who are like, I want to get a job and their parents are like, fine, do that. And other students, Catherine, oh. like yourself, are like, parents say, no, like, focus on your education. This is the time to do that. Um, you know, Nikki reminded me of a, a hardship license. I remember a couple friends in high school got hardship licenses at age 14 to drive because it was both parents working or one parent had passed away. So there are some of those lingering um, licenses that you still have to get. Um, I want to jump a little bit ahead here, if that's okay. Um, let's walk through, let's walk through this this resume for you, Catherine. You you finally put your resume together, senior year of college. I mean, about to graduate at this point. You have almost two majors and two minors under your belt. What are you thinking? What's going through your mind at this point? Are you terrified? Are you excited? Um, <clears throat> I stayed in college for five years, <laughs> so I had another. I had like an extra year, but it was pretty much like. I was in, I was in uh, Blacksburg for the summer um, and kind of looking for like a summer gig. And I ended up working at a, um, a, a farmer's market, a vendor for a farmer's market um, as like my first gig. And I think she was like more like baked goods and like, I want to say there was like some drink that like people are just very excited about. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but I mean, I was... <laughs> It was definitely like, okay, Google, how, what do I need to include in my resume? And like looking through templates and trying to figure out, okay, what do all these, all these templates have in common and pulling that and creating my own. Um, and yeah, and just revising it every, I don't know, after every, mm -hmm. over like six months or something. Um, yeah. But I mean, I definitely focused on like in my first resume before my first job, like these are, um, this is like my education. This is extracurriculars I, w I was a part of, like all the, all those things. 
And Nikki, when you were applying to your jobs, were you continually refining your resume on like a, a monthly, quarterly, yearly basis? Or is it anytime I needed to apply for a new job, I'd just tweak it here and there? I think um, what I would suggest to my younger self to do would be different from what I did. Yeah, I think I just only updated it when I was like, oh, I need a job. Um, but actually, every time you get, like, I, I am fortunate to have worked for only a couple of different organizations, but have held several different positions within that. Like every time you get a shift in your job description, you know, or your job, your role or your, or what your job is, update your resume every time. Like now I'm in charge of coordinating this program, like add that in. So then when you need your resume, your the bones of it are there, you know, like I think Absolutely. that as I got into my thirties, that's what I started doing more for sure. Yeah. So what's the most important thing on your resumes now, despite the fact that you own your own companies? Like what, what is that important thing? The one nugget that you'd say, this is it. This is the golden nugget. Huh. It's funny being a business owner, having a resume. Cause you, um, like I, or Catherine and I have both, well, speaking right, right. Like I, we have part-time work sometimes like in the winter, it's nice to have part-time income. So there have been resumes, like I've written like, owner operator of this business but i'm like looking for this gig work um, so i think with resumes it's really really important to make sure that you're offering um relevant experience for the job like i was bottle i was like packaging salsa this summer like you know it was like fresh salsa locally made i knew the owner cool like she doesn't need to know how i coordinated volunteers for three years like that's not <laughs> relevant. So I think it's also about having, I have a lot of different resumes, some that are for like gig work for me that like show that I know how, how to show up on time and be efficient, um, which are things like running your own business. Um, <laughs> but if it's something more, for, I think I have, I have several resumes for that reason. They're not all the same. Yeah. Wow, that cool. was a great you know response. That? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I've just held jobs for over 20 years. I've had mm. jobs for like a long time. So I've no, also my mom was a recruiter for a long time. So mm. I feel like I always had a really good, like somebody to look over my resumes. That's a good tip too. Like get somebody else to look over your resume. Don't be embarrassed about it. Get a friend that you trust to tell you the truth. Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really getting somebody else's eyes on that. It's so, it's so important. Yeah. I'm going to write that one down too. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have more. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so this is something that I know about you, Catherine, and I guess obviously salsa plays a part in your life off season. Can, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, not just the day-to-day -day life of a farmer in Portland, Gresham specifically where you're at now, um, but more about like the annual cycle. What does that look like? You know, if you start calendar year, January through December, can you talk about that? Yeah, um, I kind of, um, I count my calendar year starting pretty much like in March, like the beginning of the season where it's like, um, I mean, you're, we're out here every day trying to prep ground um, and you're pretty much planting from, I don't know, March through September, harvest starts in June and goes through Thanksgiving. Um, so those are like the two big, big aspects of farming. But then, um, and Stefan, you know this because we live together. I'm in the winter. I'm just dilly dallying around the house. I'm like <laughs> doing what it's like so bad. Um, I'm doing stuff that's like it's still farm work, but it I have more mental space in the winter. So I'm doing things like planning for the spring and the summer, so that once that hits. I can kind of um, turn my brain off a little bit and just execute the plan that I've created. Um, and I mean, you need to have some flexibility because we're dealing with things that are unpredictable, like the weather. Um, but I mean, that's, that's like it in a snapshot. And I know if, if it's patent pending, I totally understand, but you have an amazing spreadsheet of your like seeding and planting and all of that. I'm not sure if you're allowed or willing to show it, but could you at least describe what that is? And oh my gosh, kinda... I got it right here. Can I share my screen? Uh, you should be able to share your screen. So okay. just so that everyone knows, um, when she's pitter-pattering around during the winter um, and drinking her coffee either on the porch or inside, um, she is glued to 
her newsletter and to this planning period. Um, it is a gorgeous spreadsheet. If you like spreadsheets, this is one of the best I've ever seen. Um, and it, it really shows the, the thought process behind not only the failures that she's had in the past and how to improve upon them, but forward thinking throughout this season of planting and harvesting and not just thinking about, oh, I want this plant. Well, is that plant actually going to grow? Um, is it allowed, allowing you to share your screen? Yeah, I can right now. I can show okay. you too. Let me know if it works. Post disabled attendee screen sharing is what it says. Go for it now. Oh God. Uh, um, uh, Google Chrome, files? whiteboard. Wait, no, that's, we, we're not, not good right. with this. <laughs> so it says whiteboard, Google Chrome, or AOS alert manager. Try the Google Chrome one. Okay, I see my screen. Yes, oh, I don't know if you can. Like... Yes, we can. We can. We got it. So if you have um, your spreadsheet on that, or is it is it actually like an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah. An Excel sheet. Okay, maybe, why don't you just describe to us, just in case. Yes, absolutely. So I have a lot of different spreadsheets. Um, the, main, the main one that I look at week by week has every single plant I'm growing, every variety, every, um, every um, time I need to plant it, when I need to plant it, um, how much of the bed I'm planting, pretty much any information I need um, in the season so that I can just be like, okay, this is exactly what I'm doing. I've already thought this through. I know how much, I know what the yield is gonna be every single week. Um, I know what I'm putting into my CSA boxes every single week, um, stuff like that. And then I have like a big field map where it's like, visually it's easier to see. I have all the beds laid out um, when, each crop is occupying each bed, um, how quickly I need to like turn over that bed for the next crop. Um, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, it's almost like a checklist so that you know what you're going to be doing for the most part with some flexibility in it mm -hmm. every week. So this is about the last question that I'm going to ask before we open this up to students. So if you are a student right now and you already got in, get some like questions formulated in your head, make sure you write them down before raising your hand so you don't forget them. Um, question for, let's start with Nikki on this one. Um, as an owner, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced um, to date? Hmm. Oh, and how have you overcome them? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as an, a business owner, um, I mean, and I'll just speak, yeah, totally for myself. Um, this is not a, an occupation that you choose because you want it for any, you choose it because you want it. Um, it's, it's physically challenging. Um, the money is not great. Um, like there's, there are other reasons why people go into business for things like comfort and money. And this is not that. Um, so I think that like, um, up front, I was concerned that like my body might be really hard or like, I'd have to figure out money stuff, but like, um, because there's like a mission and a charge and a fire in here about wanting to farm that those things really are you figure them out and you learn how to work smarter like to budget through the year like Catherine said yeah like make your mental plans in the winter so you can execute in the summer and just let your body take charge and your mind in the winter like you learn how to balance those things probably the hardest the biggest challenge for me is um, like doing businessy stuff <laughs> Like having to be at a computer on a spreadsheet. I am not a spreadsheet lover the way that Catherine is. Um, but things like coordinating sales, right? Um, getting liability insurance, which you have to name your additional insured party. There's like all these terms like, oh, we went to the bank to, a, to get a bank account. And they were like, what's your EIN? And I was like, what's that now? Like these business things. That's like a, what does it stand for again? Ooh, it's like a business. It's like a tax, tax number, a tax ID thing. But there's like all these businessy things that when you establish a business, you, you need insurance. Um, like that's a, you need a bank account. 
you need an accounting software of some kind. Like it's the billing, it's invoicing people for wholesale accounts, like taking money into the right account. I also have a business partner. So she and I have access to everything together. Um, and it's a 50, 50 partnership. So I think also for us, there's like an additional layer of communication with every decision we make, which generally is very positive and also sometimes takes longer because yeah, Catherine can just like make a decision and do it. But my partner and I are very, um, we're good at communicating. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think it's the businessy stuff and just not getting to farm because I love farming. It's like having to sell it too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you for that, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Catherine, what about you? That was, that was just like everything. It's like the, like when you go into farming, unless you're working for a farm, a lot of it is like, you got to be, you got to know every, every aspect of it from like the, like, and there, there's things that like innately people are more comfortable with or like better at. So it's like, I do better with things like production planning and making sure we have efficient systems. Um, but my strong suit is not marketing sales or like doing my taxes right the first time. <laughs> so yeah. And it seems that like when you're in the farming community, that seems, it seems to be, uh, slighted that way. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say as if there are a student out there that's looking to start a company, potentially not a profitable one, but something that is a solving a need, if, if they went to business school and helped farmers learn how to do better business side, that they could probably take that over for farmers? I mean, and there are like a lot of farms that are slightly bigger than ours, because um, neither of us has employees like mm -hmm. um that do have like office managers who run all ah. of them. absolutely mm -hmm. and not even large scale agriculture i mean like five acre like mm -hmm. like small still very small scale um yeah who have people like we pay i pay somebody to do our taxes like we don't we're not doing our own taxes like we just pay someone <laughs> it is worth it to us um to pay that money rather than spend the time and our emotions on that but yeah i think if we got bigger i would hire like an office manager mm -hmm. yeah cool yeah, That's and there's really definitely, cool. like, I mean, tax people out there who, like, understand, are mm -hmm. very knowledgeable in, like, the farm specifics of taxes. Um, like, I know a couple of the people in the program go to I, Michael Menzies. We do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, Catherine, I'm really glad to hear that locking your keys in the car was not your biggest problem that you've ever had. Um, that that was, was a fun one. Times. I don't have to <laughs> 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 Well, with that being said, I want to open up the floor to students who have questions. So if you have a question as a student, make sure that you raise your hand and Adriana, the bouncer, will click on you and unmute you. Um, it looks like Alan is probably the first one to, to go on that side. Yeah, one of the questions that I have are... Um, Real quick, like, Alan, hold you on. Have... Can you introduce yourself and your uh, pronoun, please? Um, my pronouns are he and him, and uh, my name's Alan Tran. So yeah, uh, one of the questions I have were, have you ever had a bad harvest? And if you, have you had it, uh, what plans or measures did you employ? So um, yeah, a bad harvest can look like a lot of different things. And I think it's maybe important to um, distinguish like, so um, there is a, like when you're planning, when you're doing crop planning and we're planting out uh, 300 tomato plants in a couple of weeks. Like that's our plan. And we hope to get, you know, X number of pounds every week from that. We know and built into that plan is a certain amount of loss. Mm. Like we know we're going to lose like 10% to bug damage, to rot, to split, to whatever. Um, but we know that ahead of time. So we buffer in an additional like 15% more tomato plants to cushion. To cushion. Yeah, okay. um, but I think when things happen like, oh, our beautiful arugula in the spring, let's look at it. And it's just, just like pockmarked with bug holes, like, and you didn't expect that. Um, yeah, you, you try to just move <laughs> on and plant it again. And I think that's why farmers are some of the most resilient people that I know, like the ones I look up to, because you look at it, you call it, you turn it back in, you let those, that new, you know, the plant matter 
add nutrition to your soil or you pull it out if it's disease. Like you work smart, you move on, you call it, mm -hmm. you move on. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Or what do you do with your, yeah. Yeah, that arugula is too real. <laughs> um, but there's like also other things too, mm. that are a bit out of our control. Like last, last spring, early summer, there was like a big hail storm out here that oh. cut and it was like after everyone's first plantings that pretty much damaged a lot of um, like lettuce heads, mm -hmm. chard, um, all that stuff. But it's like, this is what we have. So it's just like educating the, um, the customers at market of like, this is the reality of farming where it's like, you're not going to have the most perfect looking head of lettuce every single week um, if you're growing it in, in nature. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is like ed educating. And um, luckily, I think like a lot of chefs understand that too, where it's like they understand that there's like they have they're they're not like as stern and strict as uh, yeah. as you might believe, but yeah. it's true. Awesome. Thank you, Alan, for that question. That's fantastic. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to Melissa. Melissa, please, when you get called on, introduce yourself and your pronouns if you feel comfortable. Um, my name is Melissa. Um, I go by she and her. And my question is, um, well, since I've been told that, Catherine, uh, you were a pastry chef from Stefan. And, <laughs> and so I was wondering if uh, you did you ever take culinary school? And do you recommend like, um, going into it during, after, or even before college, uh, something like that, or like while doing nutrition as well? Um, I feel like a lot yeah. of like ways to get into, um, I feel like it's all, a lot of it is connection based to get, um, into like a, I worked at, um, Pearl Bakery downtown. Um, and they sold at farmer's markets and whatnot. And I pretty much like just sent in an, sent in an application interview, did a working in, uh, did a working interview with like the team that I would actually be working with. Um, and I don't know, I think that like in businesses like that, there is a fairly high turnover rate, mm -hmm. um, especially in, in cities specifically because like generally people aren't there to become like the best pastry chef they're there to like pay rent um or like make a little bit extra money um i don't have much experience as far as like culinary school and working for other restaurants um like one of the one of my friends did go to culinary school and is like a brunch chef hoping to um own his own restaurant um, and I don't know what his, what his path was as far as getting to where, where he is now. But to, to clarify, you didn't have any experience or did you before you jumped into that position at Pearl Bakery? No, I, I didn't have much experience. And, um, I think a lot of it, as far as like seeing if it's a good fit is like the type of work that it is. Um, and even in like my, what? time period there it was easy to see the people that stayed were people who like were okay d with like a lot of monotony um and not trying to be because you in in places like that i think you have to like work your way up for sure um and i think a lot of people go into that thinking that they're going to be creating new dishes every single every single day every single week um where where in most cases it's like you're making the same thing for a three month time period and then the menu will change and then um yeah then you'll maybe get to work with the the person creating it but yeah wow. awesome Musa. that was a great question um if you have a follow-up um raise your do you have a follow-up yeah um i kind of do actually um well for me uh from like before, uh, in the overview, the New Thai Blues restaurant, my family actually owns that. And I'm actually here right now, but, <laughs> but um, as someone who's already in a family of business owners, I want, um, I'm currently taking a business class at school to like 
further hone like my whole business thing but for me I'm just really like I want to get into like a bunch of like culinary stuff but also with um farms as well where I can work with food that's like fresh and locally owned so like is there any like programs that I can try to go into even during high school <laughs> some like similar to like maybe going into like farming or something like that or agriculture or like should I even consider going into something like that right I think um there are so with the work that I did for organizing and coordinating and managing farmers markets, you get to kind of know a lot of the players in and around the local food scene. And I mean, to your second question of like, should you even like, if you're inclined to do it, do it. I think that's a great idea. And do you need it necessarily? No, but if you're inclined to, mm -hmm. I think that's how we even started. Yeah, it was like, I'll try this on and mm -hmm. it sticks. So I would just encourage you to try it. Um, I would maybe look into um, like your extension service of the state universities. So like Oregon State University has a really robust extension program, which supports small farmers like us, but they also have what they call like a master food preserver program. Mm -hmm. And I bet they have all other, like, I can't think of one specifically that's like exactly what you're talking about, but they offer a lot of like, it's not like a full semester thing. It's more like, a couple Saturdays a month and you can like try on in a less committed way, like ideas around what you're talking about. So I would check out an extension or, or like Clackamas Community College or Portland Community College. Like just, they often offer like very reasonable one-off or like four mm -hmm. off, like smaller courses on this kind of thing. That's mm -hmm. where I would start. Yeah. 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 And there are definitely like restaurants in Portland mm -hmm. um, who are like stoked to be working with farmers. So last year there was, I don't know who it was, maybe like Tusk or one of them, right. brought their entire kitchen staff out here to like tour the property because um, there's snag and produce from a couple of the farms here. Um, so there's definitely people out there and Portland's a good good place for it. Yeah, we are, we are fortunate to live yeah. in Portland as eaters, but certainly as growers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think chefs really value the quality, just straight up the quality. I mean, you can message how cool it is to eat locally and that's a great marketing thing for everybody, but the quality of locally grown food is just like, it is fresher, It less mm -hmm. hands have touched it. Like there mm -hmm. are, chefs love it. So it, it, we, we're fortunate to live in Portland yeah. for that reason. Melissa, well, so for that follow-up question, that was fantastic. All right, we're gonna move on to Danny. Danny's gonna be the next one. Please introduce yourself, Danny. Hi, I'm Danny. My pronouns are she, her. I was wondering where we could find your produce or where you sell your produce and um, what happens to the leftover produce. Mm. Hmm. That's good. Um, so I sell, though I'm not there yet, I won't be there for probably another month, month and a half. I usually sell at the Hillsdale Farmers Market in Southwest. Um, and then I have a small CSA. And then I work with a couple couple different restaurants in Portland, like smaller scale, um, that are like they're what they need. I can provide on my scale of farming. So real real quick, um, Catherine, I know what you're talking about. What you just said were three separate markets that you use, and a CSA is something that not a lot of students probably know of. Can you explain what that is, please? Yeah. So CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Um, and the gist of it is that um, the people eating the produce and the farmer are sharing in both the risks and rewards of farming. Um, so from the farmer, a lot of the costs occur before the season starts, say in like February or March, um, months before I have anything to sell. So if you're looking at cash flow, I need a lot of cash before I'm actually able to sell stuff. Um, so in most CSA programs, um, the, the people will pretty much buy a share. Um, they can buy, um, pretty much like 25, I'll, I'll speak from my, from my CSA. They, um, buy $25 or 25 weeks worth of produce at the beginning of the season. So they pay a lump sum that allows me to buy things like seeds, tools, potting soil, stuff that I need um, to start up. And then throughout the harvest season from June through November, 
um, they get um, a weekly box of veggies that they've already paid for. So it's like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, and then Nikki, where do you sell yours and um, where can we find Great. it? Um, I think Catherine is really smart or on a business sense to, to diversify her sales outlets. And I think we're realizing that particularly as business owners right now, um, our business is prime is 85 to 90% farmers markets. Um, and now that with the COVID situation, like farmers markets are shifting a lot, which I mean, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole right now, but what farmers markets look like is really different than what they, what we were anticipating and built our crop plan and whole plan on because it's 90% of our business. So I'd just like to say Catherine is uh, smart to diversify. <laughs> um, so we sell um, at the Woodstock neighborhood farmers market in Southeast, which opens June through October. So kind of same timeline as Catherine. We have a lot in the ground planting, but won't have food until probably the end of May. Um, we also do a winter farmer's market. We just tried it on this past year. Um, I love winter farmer's markets because it's the best time to eat like November through January for me, just on a personal level. Um, I like winter squash a lot and Brussels sprouts and chicory and anyway. Um, but also a, a farmer's market is my background. It's where I came from. I was in the world for 10 years before I started farming. So it was an easy fit for our business. I know the community, I know the players, I know how the rules work. Um, but also winter markets for us became financially like actually totally doable. We tried, we did four this past winter and our plan is to do it straight through November until we don't have food in 2021. Um, and I think that you really get to see the people that are dedicated to local food in the winter because it's not really nice weather. It's like kind of mm. crummy and it's really cold. And um, I really, so I really like farmer's markets, but yeah, that was a long, <laughs> we are farmer's market. Farm. But to, to okay. answer your other question too, about like where the excess produce goes, oh, right. um, a lot of markets have gleaners that come at the end. Um, yeah, um, there's an organization called Urban Gleaners. Uh, and they partner up with a lot of markets through volunteers who show up and have like a wagon or a car mm -hmm. and they take whatever produce from vendors is left over. Mm -hmm. um, we've looked into uh, like Meals on Wheels, like really specific places to donate. Um, and frankly, for us, there's very little left over. Like our scale is small and we're still figuring out how to have the right amount for markets. We've only been in business for two, a little over two years. Um, so the 10% of our business that isn't farmer's markets, we sell to people that make like hot sauce and salsas and we'll take damaged produce also off our hands for less than we're charging retail. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one in particular I'm thinking about. We are agreed on our price per pound for any red tomato in any shape and I can drop it off after the market. She lives like her kitchen is right by the market, which is just really mm -hmm. convenient. Um, and she can freeze red tomatoes and make her sauces all winter. And it's like built into her plan, her business plan to support local farmers. And here's a way we can both do it. Um, so I think we try to think creatively about waste so we can recoup some of the cost also. Awesome. Real quick, um, one, one sentence definition of gleaner. Danny was wondering what that means specifically. Um, gatherer, probably. Yeah. Donation receiver. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's move on to our last question. Thank you for those answers and Danny. Great questions. Uh, Danya, Danya, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi. Um, yeah, well, I'm Danya. My uh, pronouns is she and her. And well, I just wanted to compliment how like I, um, I wasn't expecting you guys to talk about how you guys were like planning, planning, planning during the winter and stuff. So I really like that. Um, that's something new I learned about y'all. <laughs> um, but my question is, um, Bro, so going back to when you guys were like in the beginning of being a business owner, um, did you feel financially prepared to start a business? Well, um, this is maybe where my age is actually helpful. Um, I'm 37 and came to uh, farming. To me, it felt really late. I felt like I was late to the game. Catherine and I are 10 years apart. And we joke and we play about age because it's fun. But um, I, in a lot of ways, wish I had been 10 years younger when I started farming. But it also offered me 10 years to like 
earn some money and save it and put it away. So for me, it was a very calculated 10 year plan to set money aside. Um, and my business partner is married to a person who has an income that can support them. Uh, and I think that's not uncommon in a lot of farm households where one person works off the farm and provides the benefits, the income, right? Like all the things um, and the other farms. Yeah. Um, I will say that I did not sound financially stable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I also like taking a bit, like, I, I think it's fairly, um, I think it's good to take risks. Um, and it was enough risk where I was like, Hey, I need to like actually perform as a farmer and be able to sell. Um, which I think is good coupled with like, I have some money in my bank account. Um, but yeah, part of me honestly was like, I I think that I can swing it. Like I I only had like two and a half years farming experience prior to this, but I was like, I think I can swing it. And that's why I took on a, a part-time job my first my first year. Um just because I like I thought I could, but I like wasn't sure. So I was like, okay, safety net. Um and then I I went full time livelihood farming um last year starting last spring. So I've done it for about a year now. Um, yes. And there are some dangerously low points, but um, I mean, it all works out. And I'm definitely learning like the importance of community and like knowing that if I needed to, there would be people who would be like, hey, we'll pay your rent. Hey, we'll buy you groceries. But that hasn't been the case yet. Um, yeah. I'll buy you groceries. <laughs> I also grow a bunch of food. So right. Yeah, we so food. <laughs> yeah. There's incredible food security. Yeah. And farmers markets are a really cool place to be a vendor because you can trade mm -hmm. for other things. Yeah. Like I, I don't buy a lot of food in the summer mm -hmm. at all. Like you trade for it. Mm -hmm. Which is another thing with waste, right? At the end of the day, you trade yeah. for that. You trade for your goat cheese and your loaf of bread and mm -hmm. bottle of wine and <laughs> that's dinner. <laughs> Yeah. That is awesome. Great question, Danya. Thank you so much for that. We're going to wrap up on that question. If, if they want to, they can find you at your farmer's markets. Um, is there a website that they might be able to reach you at if they have additional questions? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, you can, um, if you just Google more and more a farm or do more and more um, it'll just bring you to my website and there's like a contact page and like M-O-R-A-M-O-R-A.com. Awesome. And Nikki, for you? Um, we, uh, Catherine's profesh. Yeah, we're an Instagram farm. <laughs> um, although we are uh, creating a, an online sales platform as we speak mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. what we have to do right now. Um, but our, so Amika, A-M-I-C-A, -A, um, it's Latin for female friendship. And that's Irina and I, that's how we started our name. So our Instagram is Amika Farmers, it's plural, Amika Farmers. Um, and that we're, I'm really good about checking messages on there and yeah, follow us. We're, we have a pretty robust social media presence. Mm -hmm. I say shows what we're going to do every week, what we're up to goofy pictures of Catherine playing on <laughs> implements and yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Let's, let's jump into some, uh, some reflection, um, I'm going to screen share over here while the students are answering these questions, you can answer one, two, all three of them. What did you learn from this interview that you're excited about? How can you use this information moving forward? And then how can Passion Impact improve your experience? Go ahead and type these uh, into the chat option and we'll be reading them out. While you're writing those, um, Nikki and Catherine, we'd love to know a joke, a farming joke, a food security joke, any joke that you have that's around, that surrounds food. I'm trying to think of some that are appropriate. <laughs> Hold on. Um, actually, it's funny. Irina, my business partner, is really good joke teller. Yeah, she And is. I don't remember jokes at all. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a farm joke? Yeah, oh, I, I have no I fun. You got a vegetable joke. <laughs> I'm going to just read some of the answers the students said. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so Alan, I learned that farmers trade a lot in the summer. Absolutely, Alan. 
Uh, Danny, I learned about the careful planning that local farmers do in winter and for harvest. I'm looking forward to going to get my produce from the local sources in the future. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, and they're local, so you could go meet them at a farmer's market and they'd probably be like, oh, we saw you on a video. Uh, Adriana, learned that we should look into OSU extension services or other extension type of services at local community colleges. Absolutely. I'll give you, when I was in college, James Madison, just up the road, from Catherine, we didn't know it at the time that we were going to be best friends, but now we are. That's totally cool. She's going to shake her head and deny it. That's fine. Um, I totally went to the Virginia Tech, um, what do you call it, extension service for some of my projects in college. And so that was super helpful. So definitely look into those. It was really great. Uh, Danny, go Beavs. Adriana, go Beavs. Uh, Alan, spreadsheets are very important by having these, uh, by having these skills is important. So Potentially, like having the, the, the spreadsheet side, you know, kind of nailed down now could really help in a lot of planning or just organizing. Um, let's see, Kayla, Melissa, Christina, Mary, Danya, anybody, or Amy, anybody else that has some ideas? All right, we got Melissa over here. Oh, sorry, Danny says we should get more of our office food from local farmers. Awesome idea, Danny. Awesome idea. Uh, I learned that being a business owner of whether it'd be a, in farming or restaurant requires a lot of math and business stuff that may not be easy to understand at first. Absolutely, absolutely. Alan, PI can help improve by making uh, use, le us learn these new skills. Absolutely, you know what, Alan, I'm gonna have you start farming and we're gonna have our own farming. <laughs> I love it. Yep, uh, Christina, this quote, this got me really interested in locally produced food. And after this whole quarantine thing is over, I really want to go to farmer's market. I went to one once, but I don't think I appreciated it enough. Absolutely. And there's so many, there's so many farmer's markets um, all around. Mary says, I learned that this is, that it's good to do an extra 15% produce in case of any hardships that veggies might go through. Absolutely. Alan learned to have a cushion. Adriana, Alan takes care of the plants in the office. Absolutely. Um, Kayla, be healthy. And Kayla also leads uh, with Christina some, uh, some workouts on Wednesdays that I was unable to go to today, but they kick your butt. Melissa, I can continue to stretch out and put detail in my career path as a cafe owner. Absolutely. So there's a lot of great, great stuff here uh, for students. Please make sure you put your give pulse in there just to make uh, a list of that. I've also been using those uh, to publicize a lot of the information that we're gaining from this to show what you are learning. So it could be really helpful. Um, with that being said, um, if we could have Adriana the Bouncer unmute everybody and in a second, we'll say thank you. We have some upcoming events, passionimpact.org backslash teleprogramming. Go ahead and check out all the events that we have here um, on a weekly basis. We're online every single weekday. So go ahead and jump in that. If you'd like to subscribe to our blog uh, and newsletter, we have students running that. So passionimpact.org backslash subscribe. Uh, with that, thank you, Catherine and Nikki, for your time. You thank have been you. fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And we're probably you. taking your time from the field. So get back and. All right. Some great no, the, day, the day's over. The day's over. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And for the students who joined, I hope you learned something. And um, it was great seeing all y'all as well. Okay. Bye. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.